Last week I was talking to a few of my seminary-educated pastor friends. We started discussing baptism, sin, and salvation. You know, light lunch conversation topics. I noticed that sometimes the questions I expect to be really easy for pastors stump me. Like, what is the gospel? What is righteousness? My pastor friends and I realized that for many of us, these topics are hard to talk about. We don't have good language for them. We lean away from heavy language of condemnation and fear, but haven't found new ways to articulate the basics of our faith. So with that as my backdrop, we approach Romans, a book that might get a bad reputation when it comes to misuse and feels like intense theology for this bright spring morning. This Sunday, we start four weeks looking at the book of Romans. This letter written by Paul is the longest of his letters in the Bible. Romans is different to the other epistles or letters of Paul. First, it is the only letter to a church that Paul didn't found. He hadn't even met the Roman church yet. I understand a bit more of the first 15 verses of this text as Paul introducing himself, trying to gain a footing with a group of people who don't know who he is. He is giving them a context for himself. In the same way that I would give some background when I introduce someone, and I want people to know why they would want to talk with them. For instance, this is my friend Alyssa who's visiting. We were roommates in seminary um, about 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, And she just finished up pastoring in Hamilton, Ontario. A little context. Some scholars note that Paul's language to the Roman church is more cool and dispassionate than some of his tone in letters to churches that he may be more familiar with. Paul offers a more sustained and careful account of his own positions and makes little clear reference to the church in Rome. These distinct features prompt earlier generations of scholars to identify Romans as a summary of Paul's thought. Unlike his other letters that were written to address specific communities and their problems. It also helps me to realize that Paul was most likely dictating his letter to a scribe. We tend to speak differently than we write. I had one student who would write an entire paragraph without any punctuation. In getting them to start noticing where they might need to use some punctuation, I would have them read their work out loud to me, and when they felt like they needed to breathe, I'd say, that's a really good spot to put in some punctuation. If you notice, the first seven verses of this text have only commas. Thus, approaching the thoughts captured in these run-on sentences can feel overwhelming. We are also switching from narratives, stories captured in the Bible, to a letter containing Paul's thoughts and theology. So Paul starts with an opening, goes on to give thanksgiving, and then gives what is called his thesis for the rest of this letter, there in verse 16 and 17. 
Paul is giving background to his theology, but it is one-way communication, not back-and-forth conversation. Letters don't really capture much dialogue. Rome was a big city, and the church there might not have been very large. Paul expresses affirmation for their work that they are doing and that he wants to join them in it. This big task that they share of including people from many backgrounds in the big tent of God's love and salvation through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Paul is longing for the mutual encouragement of, we're in this together. And then we come to his theme for the next 11 chapters, verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is God's saving power for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. When we look at the life, transformation, and then work and teaching of Paul, it seems almost humorous for him to state that he is not ashamed of the gospel. No kidding. Paul, who had a dramatic conversion to being a Christ follower. Paul, who went on to take three significant missionary journeys and taught, preached, and started churches. Of course, He's not ashamed of the gospel. It's the opposite of that. He's proud of it. But maybe he is making some space for some of us who do feel ashamed sometimes. Not ashamed of God's saving work in the world, but very conflicted about how that has been communicated. We are confused about how we articulate the gospel and salvation and when it is appropriate or tolerable to do that without being labeled some kind of Jesus freak. We want to be subtle, not wanting to offend or be pushy. Mary Austin writes, Paul proclaims that he is not ashamed of the gospel, but I often find myself ashamed of the church and what we have done collectively in the name of the gospel. How do we separate God's good news from our flawed expression of it? Are there places where we should be ashamed where do we find God's righteousness, as Paul calls it, mixed with our human frailty? Maybe Paul is being gracious to us there. If you're ashamed, I get it, but I'm not. Yet, as we go on, these verses offer that it is God who is faithful to us first. We are inspired by the faithfulness and love of God and respond with faith and love. For many in the biblical text, salvation was understood as deliverance from physical danger, freed from Egypt, crossing the Red Sea. These were their defining stories. For us, it might be truer to say that salvation is deliverance from being caught in cycles of sin and thinking that we can save ourselves. 
God's desire for salvation is expansive. It reaches to us and even on to all of creation. It starts with God, and then we mirror or respond to God's actions. Humans are enveloped in God's justice and righteousness. It is a gift. This grace that God offers us, we can't achieve it when it is abundantly offered just because we are deeply and fully held in the love of God. A podcast I really appreciate is The Bible Worm, where a Jewish and Christian theologian reflect together on the texts for that week. Coming out of the book of Matthew that we followed during the narrative lectionary, and now turning to Romans, they painted a picture of salvation in this way. Salvation, yes, it's where you go when you die, but in this text, it is a setting free from the power of oppression in the world here and now. Talking about the world constructed by those with ruling power. Proclaiming a gospel that Caesar is no longer Lord, Jesus Christ is Lord. The way that Rome ordered the world in ways that are unjust is no longer the way the world is going to be. But we are working together with God to this more just world. And that's what salvation is. That's what justice is. That's what righteousness is. God is acting in ways in the world that nudge the world closer to justice. And God is faithful to us. And so when we live in a faithful response to God, then we must move the world towards justice. We trust in, a, in God, and God trusts in us. And together we work to move the world towards the just community that God has in mind. I think I can work with a definition like that and live into that invitation. Let's trust that God brings about a new world that is closer to justice. Let's be faithful in our response not ashamed of our role. Let's talk to people about this more just world, that it is possible. As we approach this table, where we tell the story of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection, we do proclaim it as good news We are taking Jesus' life into us and allowing this community and our life together to shape us for the work of God's work in the world. We are acknowledging that we don't have to generate this love and justice on our own, but that we do it in response to what God has already done for us. God has faith in us and with us. May we respond in kind to that faith.